travel with a very small service dog, Gigi. Um, I had her up here. I dislocate and separate all my joints spontaneously, and she was being my heating pad. But right now, she's going to be my audience. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to come today. I do ask for your attention. I have a lot vested in this um, subject matter. I ask that you give me your full attention, putting the cell phones away and so on and so forth. At lunchtime, you can catch up with the rest of the world. Okay. Let's see if this works. So, I am Amina. I've got a bunch of credentials. Um, I am the clinical director at On Eagle's Wings Ministries. We are a ministry located in Charlotte, North Carolina. We have four components to our ministry. The biggest one is we do run a safe house for female minors of domestic sex trafficking. They are American girls trafficked in America by Americans. This is not just third world stuff, as was mentioned. Before I had this job, I was a traumatologist in private practice for many, many, many years, working with severely traumatized adults, most of them women, a lot of them with sexual abuse. Um, I'm a counselor, I'm a coach. The coach piece helps because staffing, this is very intense work to do, and our staff needs a lot of support to stay with it, healthy boundaries, and not to burn out too soon. Um, and I can put now that I'm an international speaker because yesterday at 4 o'clock I just got back from Belize. Um, we all have problems. So I want to start out with the healing process. Basically, there's two pieces that I'm going to cover, the healing process and aftercare. And I'm going to try to run through these slides for those of you who are really hungry. Um, the one thing that I would like for you to keep in mind, you were talking about it, is when you come across the path with anybody, and I'll show you a list of including, in addition to what Holly Smith had to say, things to look for. But I ask you a couple of things. If you come across the path of somebody who is being trafficked, you may have a belligerent teenager on your hands. I raised one, I know. Or you may have a wounded soul. I ask that you take the perspective of the wounded soul first. Then consider whether they're just being the average teenager. Nothing personal, folks. <laughs> um, and in that, when we talk to, especially with the law enforcement piece, there is a huge, huge difference in how this is going to go if you think interrogation, interview, or chatting, just talking. I ask you to separate out interrogation. This is not the population to be doing that with. Interviewing, if it's contrived questions, they'll shut down. But if you talk, and if the first thing you ask is, do you have to go to the bathroom? Are you hungry? Are you thirsty? When was the last time you ate? Are you tired? Should we do this a different time? Basic needs first. So I just want to put that out there before we sort of get going. All the girls, 100% of the girls in our program come in with PTSD. Does anybody know what that means? Thank you. Post-traumatic stress disorder, it's not just veterans. 100% of our girls, some of them with complex PTSD, that's PTSD on steroids. We don't have time to get into that today, but I just want to show you a little bit about the effects of trauma on the person. So PTSD is a big piece. The other piece is the triggers. Uh, as Holly said, there is a contrived manipulation and setting in triggers. For example, one of our girls who comes through, pimps don't serve steak. Pimps don't take it to the doctor. And Lord knows, because we've had to, they don't take it to the dentist. So drive through food, fast food, fast food, fast food. A lot of our girls are hooked on fast food. One of the girls, she loved, Mc, um, what was it, Burger King, but don't take her through the drive through That was a trigger for her. So some of the things here that are everydayness 
in all of the situations that you're involved in may trigger somebody. And if, they, if you see a sudden reaction that is an overreaction or out of context, that's something to keep in mind as well. This kind of trauma changes your self-perception and then it changes your world perception as well. The self-perception, you are given many, many negative messages repeatedly, followed by some physical stuff usually to keep that message ingrained. So your self-perception changes radically. Anything that was positive has to be buried in order to survive. The world perception, a couple of things. Our girls, again, through pimps and traffickers, and even in labor trafficking, don't talk to the police. Don't talk to any rescuers. Stockholm syndrome, trauma bonding, that's a big, big, big piece, and that's how you get a girl to be repeatedly raped night after night and hand you money for it. That's what happens. Um, and generational legacies, sometimes if the family that the girl comes from, now Taken is one movie, we like to say it's not that neat and tidy and nobody's come after and tried to get our girls home. Um, if it, there's generational abuse in the house, how far back has this gone? <coughs> As a clinician, I actually had trafficking cases that I didn't realize were actually trafficking cases until I really got into this work, and I thought it was incest and then some. Post-traumatic stress disorder, what is it? Why does it matter? How common is it among victims? Our girls are 100% have been diagnosed, <coughs> clinically diagnosed with PTSD. The vast majority of survivors have PTSD, and that's why it's important to look at it. Um, it is a, under the umbrella of an anxiety disorder. The good news about PTSD is you only get it if you've been severely traumatized enough to get it, and clinically, it is workable. Unlike some sort of a chemical disorder or something where you might mitigate circumstances through pharmacology drugs, okay? As I said, it's a, can you guys read this at all? Okay. It is an anxiety disorder that some people get after living through or seeing a dangerous event. Some girls that are in stables, the pimp says, if you don't do what I want you to do, if you don't bring in your quota, we said a thousand a night. If you don't bring in your quota, you watch me beat the living daylights out of her. And that's harder to take sometimes than being living daylights beaten out of you, because you know what it is, but it's awfully hard to see it happening to somebody else. Um, when in danger, it's natural to feel in, afraid. You, we, we don't want to be walking off the edge of bridges. We have something in our brain that says, wait a minute, stop, consider it. This might not be a good idea. And that's natural. Um, in, and part of this also, too, is the fight or flight response, which has not changed much since the caveman days, basically. Either you slay the saber-toothed tiger or your dinner. So these healthy reactions are meant to protect us and keep us safe and intact. When PTSD enters, it's like hitchhikers on this process and it disrupts the process. So you can feel stressed or frightened and it's instead of being able to flee or fight, you close down, you freeze or dissociate. Neurobiology, you thought you got out of school, but you didn't. <coughs> so let's see if this thing works. On here, this is a um, MRI scan. Has anybody ever seen this before? Some, some folks use this, yeah? Okay. <coughs> MRI scan, sagittal scan this way, okay. This is your brain. This on the left side is a normal brain. See the white part around the edge? That's the dura. The dura is the membrane that encases everything that has spinal cord fluid in it. Okay, it's down our spine and it's around our brain. So on the left side, it, oh, hey, ho, whoa. 
I always say my assistant's so fire, but usually I don't have it in my hand when I'm doing that. <laughs> on the left side, you see the size of the Dora. On the right side, this is a maltreated brain. This is only happens in a developing brain, by the way. And we did hear the age 12.3, still developing. So the size on the right, on the right side, the dura is thicker because the brain grew smaller. In the middle here, you see ventricles, these dark areas that are filled with fluid. In the abused brain, the ventricles are bigger because the brain matter grew smaller. <coughs> What this, in essence, is illustrating is that PTSD does affect the structure of the brain. This is a PET scan. That one showed the structure of the brain. This one shows the function of the brain. The more color, the more activity. The way this is, is the front, the face is at the top and the back of the skull is at the bottom. So up here, the cortex, thinking, ideas, rational thoughts, subtle emotions, dreaming, so on and so forth. Notice the level of activity in the normal brain. Lots of activity in that frontal cortex. Notice the level of activity in the abused brain. Notice where the activity is in the abused brain. where fight or flight and survival mechanisms are housed in the base of the skull. So this person that's had the abuse has got a lot going on here in the fight or flight mechanism in the survival level of existence. It's pretty telling. So I want to go through these. Um, this, what I'm doing, it's really important to me that you understand that when you cross paths with somebody who has been diagnosed with PTSD, that you don't ever say, get over it. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. That happened before. That was, that was a while ago. And this is why, when you say that stuff, that absolutely does not work. So again, this is your brain, the cortex up at the top, is that thinking center. The hippocampus is conscious memory. You know how to drive. You knew how to drive here or walk here because you've done it by rote, and your brain has just sort of imprinted that, which side the gas pedal is, which side the, the brake pedal is, and so on. The amygdala is the seat of emotional memory, the fight or flight also, too. The thalamus is where we bring in through our senses stimuli and messages. We're a sensory species. So the normal translation, you see all of the, we get a message in and it goes through. You see the arrows connecting. It's filtered through our ideas, our logic, our conscious memory, our emotional memory about it. And then we create a response, which to me is um, intellectual, or a reaction, which is emotional. This is what happens when a trauma or one of those triggers hitchhikes, hitchhikes on a normal sensory message. Um, one of the examples, Fields of Hope. We have the table outside, Fields of Hope. We make luscious bath and body products. Our survivors, they're survivor made by the girls that we have. We tried doing men's cologne. We tried doing products that, that were um, for the male market. Didn't work, way too triggering, way too triggering because of the cologne smells. Now a couple of our girls it was triggering in a bad way, but another girl got off on it. That's not good either. Either way you look at it, it's still a trigger. 
So one of the things is also too, for example, we never use white sheets in our house. Color in hotels and motels? White. White. <clears throat> big, big trigger, big trigger. It's hard enough to get our girls to lay in beds when they first get here. Also too, when did they work? At night. When do we want them to be awake and go to school? During the day. If we give them a week of doing nothing except assimilating to turning that clock around so that they're awake during the day and sleeping at night. So basically, when a trigger comes in, there is a biochemical, physiological, and hormonal process that happens that we cannot alter. It would be saying to yourself, don't blush. Stop, face. Stop now. Heart, do the rumba beat. You can't tell it to do that. So basically what happens is the traumatic reminder comes in, the cortex becomes underactive. Thoughts, logic, out the window. The hippocampus becomes underactive. Conscious memory, oh, that's okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, out the window. Look at the size of the arrow right to the amygdala. It becomes a super highway right to the amygdala, which is the fight or flight or emotional response center. Other things that happen is our auditory sense becomes diminished. Our peripheral vision becomes dimmed. We get really laser focused. Our digestion closes down. All blood flow ceases in the digestion and it goes to muscles. Why would that be? Fight or flight. Okay. Um, our bladder loosens. When little kids are afraid, they pee their pants, they can't help it. They would love to try, but they can't help it. This is all happening in the body on its own because of a trigger. There is something that you can do about it um, to affect change. Uh, we incorporate all of this at On Eagle's Wings Ministries. Part of it, oh, geez, wrong button, sorry. Part of it over here is where the safe house is. Our house is intentionally very, very benign. Same floors, same wall coloring, same, the furniture edges are soft. There is not anything that is sharp in the girls' rooms. They don't even have um, push pins in their rooms. The interior decorated want, wanted to put a glass top table in the living room? No. Trauma-informed, big, big idea, is knowing what is in the highest and best interest of your clients, your residents at that time. Putting glass top tables, you get somebody in a PTSD moment, smash the table, hurt themselves, hurt somebody else, doesn't work. Uh, psychotherapy, all of our girls are required to uh, participate in psychotherapy. Um, psychopharmacological, if we, they need to take antidepressants and anti-anxieties or sleep meds, number one, sleep meds, to come in enough from the edges to participate in their own care. We'll do that for them. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to affect a little bit of change in this whole process, and this takes time so that they're not reacting, that knee-jerk, that knee-jerk, reacting, reacting, having the reactions. Does this make sense to everybody? So this is why it doesn't, say, it doesn't work to say, get over it, it was in the past, he's not here now, things like that. He's not here now is actually a trigger, because what did you just do? Reminded her of him. We had one, we had a Bible study, um, this gal wanted to come in, we are faith-based, real quick story, volunteer came in, she was vetted, background checks on everybody. Um, she came in, was doing a Bible study, and we have one girl there, and she turned, now also being Christian, we have a lot of people that say, and I'm gonna make fun, because I'm from Vermont, so I get to do this, that come in and say, the Lord, <laughs> God Almighty, has put on my heart to help these girls. Can I get an amen? Yeah. 
that's not okay, that's not enough, that's not trauma-informed. I have no doubt that your God told you something, but not with that attitude. So she came in, she was doing the Bible study, and she turns to the girl and she says, so tell me about your rape. That child spun in her own silence for two weeks because she didn't want to get the volunteer in trouble. But I'll tell you, she was some nasty walking around the house until she finally fessed up and said what happened. We thanked the volunteer not to come again. That's not okay. That is not trauma-informed. When they're in it, there is a protocol when they're in it. The first thing is to stay calm. If you, somebody comes across your path and they're like not in touch with the here and now, or overwhelmed and flooded with emotion, especially if somebody starts talking about this a little bit and then the floodgates open, the first thing is to breathe. It is biochemically, physiologically impossible to be deep breathing and anxious at the same time. It's a free tool, it's available 100% of the time, and nobody can take it away from you. Everybody. Now you don't get to nap after that. <laughs> uh, grounding them uh, times four person, place, event, and self. Nope, I did person, place, there's four of them. Um, using a calm voice and a calm demeanor, there's a gal that I worked with up in Vermont. We had uh, peer, peer support groups, and I'm going to say this a, a little bit away, and she, she said, I don't know why it is I don't have any clients. <laughs> well, it's not very melodic, soft, soothing voice that this gal had, and not one of us had the guts to say. <laughs> It's not the soft, melodic, therapeutic voice. So keeping a calm voice and demeanor, because if you get wired, they're so sensitive and hypervigilant that they're gonna get wired with you. So the, the, the thing not to do is to say, okay, we've got it, okay, we're gonna be okay here. Let me, we'll just, I'll just get out my list, okay, we're gonna breathe, right? All right, okay, we're gonna breathe. It doesn't work because the girls will get jacked up right with you and they'll be off. Um, make eye contact. The most familiar thing in the world is the human face. The most familiar thing on the human face is a pair of human eyes. You make eye contact with somebody, and I have gotten down with the girls, and I've tried to get right in their line of sight, because it's really hard to stay in your head while you're making eye contact with somebody else. Breathing. Remember that biochemically, physiologically impossible, deep breathing at the same time and anxiety? So sometimes if you've got somebody in your presence who they're breathing rapidly and shallowly, you can say, I'm going to start counting for you. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, four. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, good. In, two, three, four, out, two, three, nice. In, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. In, two, three, four. Out, two, three, four. Everybody still awake? <laughs> I always like to check in on that one. It works. The one thing that our staff has found that works above all else is the breath for themselves and for the girls. When we check in with somebody, because we don't know what they're in in the moment, you can say, it's okay. Not fine, ducky, peachy. But okay is a very universal word. It's okay. It's now, not then. Very universal, benign words. The thing not to say is, it's okay, he's not raping you now. Because what did you just do? added a sensory message. Where did she just go? <clears throat> Out. Right. Okay. So it's okay. It's now, not then. I don't ever say you're safe. Because if some, you're safe here, because I don't know what she's got going on inside her mind. Because obviously she's not feeling safe, so I'm not going to tell her her reality is that she is safe. 
check de-escalation, check to see if their eyes are making more contact, if they, feel, if they look more grounded, if, if the uh, breath has slowed down, if they're starting to talk, stop shaking, stop clutching, clenching. Uh, it takes discernment and discretion to do this, and this is not something you do lightly. Repeat each step as necessary. Processing. We had a volunteer in a van with girls say, boy, that was really rough, wasn't it? Because these, go these girls will care for you before they care for themselves. Because that's what they were taught, especially if they were in a stable, to do with other girls. You watch out for each other. So processing, if you want to process this, you go, that's the first. Thank you, Jesus, we got through it. And the second is find somebody that you trust and somebody who is also trauma-informed away from the victim or the survivor. Process your own stuff there. What you do with the survivor is say, how are you doing? What do you need right now is a great open-ended question. And it gives them a choice because in the life, there is no choice. 